Welcome everyone to another session of the data learning seminars. Today we have Johan Bremer from Welcome AI Amsterdam. He did his PhD at Heidelberg, Heidelberg University and after that he completed a, new, um, a postdoc in NYU. So today he'll speaking about weekly supervised causal representation learning. Thank you Johan for sharing your time with us and yep, I'll leave the audience with you. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for having me, Cesar. It's it's a pleasure. And indeed, I will talk about uh, causal representation learning from weak supervision, um, joint work with uh, Pim Dahan, uh, Taco Cohn, and Philip Lippe here at uh, Qualcomm AI Research Amsterdam. Before I get started, I just want to say if you have questions, I'm not sure how you usually do it, but but please interrupt me at any time and, and ask. Um, and I should be able to see it if you raise hands, but if I don't react to that, uh, just, just free, feel free to talk over me at any time. When you see a scene like this, you are probably not thinking these are some very pretty pixels in this image and uh, you, you find the correlation patterns between the pixels interesting. Instead, you as humans immediately pass the scene as showing a number of objects. Maybe you're thinking about there's a robot finger operating on some form of uh, simple table and there are some kind of lights that, that, that light up when the robot finger touches them. Um, and you're not just thinking about this small number of objects uh, with their properties, like the position of the robot arm and, and the question of whether the lights are on. But you may also be thinking about the relations between the objects in some way. Um, and in particular, I, I assume that you're thinking about these um, expressively or in, intuitively in, in some kind of causal way. You're probably thinking that the, the robot finger touching one of these buttons causes the light to go on. You're probably not thinking that somebody is sitting under the table with a magnet in their hand. And anytime the, the light goes on, the magnet pulls the, the robot finger uh, to the button, uh, right? Now, in these regards, you are uh, quite different from most of today's machine learning system. Machine learning systems really just reason about, well, most of them at least, uh, data on the level of, of the raw input data. So in terms of pixels, rather than in terms of a small uh, number of, of high level concepts. And they typically reason about the interactions between these variables in terms of statistical correlations rather than causal mechanisms between them. Now, in this talk, um, I will talk a little bit if we can about under which circumstances we can push machine learning systems to reason about data more in terms of meaningful high-level representations, like the position of a robot finger and the question of whether some lights are on rather than pixels, and whether we can push them to reason about causal structure in a scene, like the fact that the robot arm causes a light to go on, or maybe that, that some of these lights are connected in some causal way, as opposed to statistical correlations. In particular, I give some, some broad introduction to this, but I, in particular, I want to talk about uh, a paper that we just presented at NeurIPS in New Orleans, um, Weekly Supervised Causal Representation Learning, where we ask exactly this question, can we learn causal variables, the high-level meaningful representations from low-level data like pixels? And can we also learn the causal structure between them? And can we do this in a way that doesn't require explicit labels in the training data? And I wouldn't be asking this question if I wouldn't have an, uh, a good answer to this. So I, I will show you that, yes, this is possible with a particular form of weak supervision. I'll explain what I mean with that. But uh, to give you a sneak peek already, we will show that we can learn these high-level concepts from data um, if we break the IID assumption, if we don't just observe independent images, but observe uh, pairs of images before and after something happens. And I will make this a little bit more precise later. But um, theory is just one part of the puzzle here. And we also introduce a new kind of variational autoencoder, um, a, a machine learning model we call an implicit latent causal model. I'll unpack that a little bit in a second and show um, how these implicit latent causal models can be used in, in practice to identify causal variables and causal structure from images in some experiments. Now, I also want to wrap up this talk with a bit of a um, criticism of, this, of, of my own work here. And we'll talk about how this is not really useful in practice yet and um, talk about the steps that we as a community and us as a research team in particular still need to solve in order to make this uh, this work useful. So if you're hoping for some off the shelf method that you can directly use on, on your particular research problems, I, I already want to uh, disappoint you here. Um, we, this, is not, this is more on the fundamental side of things and we are slowly making progress towards applicable, but I hope this is still interesting for you. So let's start with the problem. Um, I am interested in the question under which circumstances it is possible to learn the meaningful high-level variables and the causal structure between these high-level variables from pixel-level data. This problem 
is the combination of two problems that, that researchers have been interested in in the past. The first that a lot of causality work has focused on is the problem of causal discovery or causal inference or Bayesian structure learning, which are roughly all the same thing. In these fields, you assume that you have some data set given in terms of um, some high-level causal variables. So in a healthcare application, for instance, you could have a tabular data set that, that shows you um, the age, the gender, the, the pre-existing conditions of patients, then some kind of treatment, and then in the end, whether the treatment was successful. And then you could try to infer whether maybe uh, some pre-existing conditions like reading Harry Potter is causally related to um, uh, some outcome of your measurement, these, these kind of things. So your, your goal is to kind of learn the causal structure between all the variables in your data set. Um, but this approach, uh, there's a lot of work on this, and it's, it, it's, it's really useful in many contexts. But this approach is only of limited use for AI contexts, where often you observe data on some low-level sensor input. Uh, for instance, you, you have a camera feed in your self-driving car, or you have some, some recording device or something like that. And uh, no one tells you from the pixels of your camera feed how you can, can read off causal variables um, a priori. So then these tools from causal discovery and inference are not directly applicable. The second line of research that this ties into is um, known as disentangled representation learning. Here, we don't really care about causality. Here we care about, given some low-level data, can we map this to a lower number of high-level variables? So in particular, people often focus on the case where we have um, input data in the form of images, no further labels usually. And uh, then we try to map these images to what we think of as meaningful high-level variables. So for instance, the positions of objects, the um, uh, states of things. And one way that people have made this problem a little bit more tractable in the past is um, to assume that the high-level concepts are statistically independent from each other. Sorry. That's not a great assumption, though. In many cases, um, the, the high-level concepts that we really care about are not independent in a statistical sense. Um, for instance, if you think about the existence of a fork on a table as one variable and the existence of a knife on the table as another variable, I think as a human, these are very um, a meaningfully distinct properties of a system if you if you look at images but still they are statistically highly correlated because usually when we eat something with a fork there will also be a knife nearby um, now in our work we focus on the question the, the problem of causal representation learning which combines both of these directions and uh, generalizes them like in disentangled representation learning we start from a low level unstructured representation of the data so the pixels taken by a camera for instance and our goal is to learn a, a neural encoder such that it maps these images to a smaller set of high-level variables that meaningfully describe the scene. Um, but we don't want to assume that they're independent. Instead, we assume that there's some causal structure between them. So maybe uh, in this dinner table example, there is some, some variable that, that determines whether something shows a, a dinner scene. And then this causally affects um, both the presence of a fork and a knife, something like that. Um, some, some structure between the variables, they're not independent anymore, but also um, they're causal in the sense that, that I will make more precise in a second. Now, why should you care about this problem? Um, why should you learn causal representations from low-level data? I, I think there's roughly speaking three reasons why this direction of research could be interesting. One is that sometimes causal structure may be of interest in itself. This is, for instance, the case in some uh, scientific problems. The second is um, that causal representations provide an abstraction of a scene, right? We, we From all the low-level details in the pixels, we abstract a much smaller number of high-level variables. And this may be more manageable, um, for instance, for, for reasoning, for planning, for, for making predictions, all kinds of downstream tasks that we care about. There's a second level of abstraction that's a little bit more subtle, which is um, that in some dynamical systems, we're not really talking about that today, but in some dynamical systems, the, the causal mechanisms may be some form of abstraction of the microscopic details of the time evolution. But that's something I'm not getting into today. The third reason why uh, causal representations may be uh, of interest is that um, causal models describe a system through, in a particular factorized way, um, where um, there's a kind of a reasonably small number of, of, of mechanisms in a system. And um, many people think it is likely that when we talk about changes to a system, we talk about um, observing 
uh, process in different contexts, for instance, um, autonomous driving, both in simulation and in the real world, that only some of these mechanisms change when you go from one context to another context. Um, if you then write down your causal model, uh, if, uh, your description of the system as a causal model, then it may be easier to adapt this causal model to such changes. In other words, causal models may be more suitable to reasoning under changing conditions. However, this is a hypothesis. There's very little empirical evidence for this claim at this point. And this will be very context dependent. More generally, I think all of these, these benefits here are um, plausible and uh, people have, have put them forward since, since um, I don't know, many decades ago, largely uh, since 2000 roughly. But um, the, the, the jury is still out on how beneficial causal modeling really is for, for machine learning context. In this talk, um, I will absolutely not answer any of these questions. I will assume that you're interested in, in causal representations, that you're interested in learning the meaningful variables and the re causal relations between meaningful variables from low-level low data. But I will not really talk about the, the question of what can you do with these after you've learned them, except for like some, some very small things at the end. And I think it's very important that at some point we actually provide some, some uh, clear benefit to uh, these learned representations that, that we demonstrate on some downstream task. Not today, though. Now, that's the problem that uh, I want to solve, and I hope I gave you a glimpse of why it might be interesting. Um, before we actually get into our contributions, I want to um, talk a little bit about the tools um, that we uh, use here. I will introduce uh, causal models very briefly, and if this is something that you're all super familiar with, maybe somebody can uh, tell me to, to cut it short, uh, but I also try to keep it reasonably short. And the second um, tool that we need later is the notion of identifiability. Uh, that's kind of a more mathematical notion of under which circumstances can we learn something uh, with guarantees. And I also try to keep that short. First, causality. And then there's two ways of talking about causal models, at least. Um, I think on a semantic level, what causal models do is that they label relations between some variables, random variables to be precise, as that of cause and effect, right? So for, for a causal model, there's difference between saying um, ice cream uh, consumption causes the number of hours that the sun is shining and the number of hours that the sun is shining causes ice cream consumption. And uh, maybe you, you directly have an idea of which of these two may be a good world model and which of them isn't, but this is because humans intuitively reason about uh, causality. Now, this is just a word so far. What does it do? Um, causal models are able to not just describe one probability distribution like statistical models, but also um, uh, describe how probability distributions behave under changes. Um, so in particular, we can say that I, I take Cesar here and perform a very unethical experiment on, on him and force him to eat ice cream every day now, no matter if the sun is shining or not. This is also known as living in Amsterdam for, for those who have experienced that. Um, with a causal model, uh, of, of this, this joint system of ice cream consumption and sun hours, we can now uh, predict um, the probability distribution uh, of ice cream consumption and sun hours under this these changed conditions. So we can both reason about uh, kind of the, the normally occurring observational data if we just observe somebody eating ice cream and the sun shining, and we can uh, reason about this, this control trial that I'm doing with Cesar um, uh, about uh, the, the ice cream consumption and sun hours under this condition. And, and the causal model lets us reason about this. And there would be a different prediction um, if the causal model predicts uh, the sunshine causing ice cream consumption, and then for the ice cream consumption causing sunshine model, right? Uh, if, if the latter were true, um, then forcing somebody to eat ice cream would obviously change how much sun we have, and that would be a good idea. It's a good idea anyway. Anyway, these are the, the main uh, properties of causal models. Now let me make this a little bit more mathematical. Um, th there's different formalism for this, but we use one um, introduced or largely popularized by uh, Judea Pearl around 20 years ago called a structural causal model. In a structural causal model, we um, describe, let me turn this to a laser pointer, a set of causal variables in, in blue here. So this is for instance, um, ice cream consumption or uh, sunshine hours. Um, and we model them with, mechanisms. A mechanism is a function that takes as input some noise variable and predicts as output a causal variable. And um, the, the key thing here is that uh, for those causal variables that have parents, uh, so causes, um, the mechanism also takes as inputs all the, the causes. So in particular in this um, uh, two variable case where we have A causes B or uh, Z1 causes Z2, 
then Z1 will just be a function of the corresponding noise variable, while Z2 will also be a, uh, described by a function of Z1. Um, each noise variable has an associated probability distribution. You can just imagine this as a standard uh, Gaussian if you want. And by taking these probability distribution and pushing them forward through the mechanisms, um, we arrive at a probability distribution over the causal variables. And this is the observed probability distribution that we just get if we let a system unfold and, and uh, just record what happens. Just one technical thing um, here I on the slide, I also introduced the solution function. This is the overall map from the noise variables to the causal variables. And I just mentioned this now because I get back to this um, quite a bit later today. Details are not important here. Uh, the main thing is a structural causal model allows us to compute these observation distributions, kind of the distribution of causal variables if we just observe. But we can also reason about, um, as I said before, changing conditions. For instance, we can perform interventions and an intervention replaces one of the mechanism with a different uh, mechanism. So for instance, we could replace the mechanism that determines somebody's natural ice cream consumption with a new mechanism that says we force you to eat ice cream every day. And then um, with this new mechanism, you can compute a new uh, distribution, which is then the, the uh, distribution you observe under these interventions. This factorization into mechanisms thus allows us to reason about changes in a causal model. Anybody has any questions about the, the, the idea of causal models? Now would be a great time to, to speak up. Otherwise, I'll just continue. All right. Um, the second tool I wanted to talk about is identifiability. Maybe let me say this in words first. Identifiability is a property of a family of models that says that in principle, just given data, you can identify the model uh, as in you can kind of just looking at the data, you can, you can figure out which model out of this family um, generated the data. Let me make this more precise. Let's say we have um, some model class, um, uh, and I would note this with a curly M. Um, we say this model class is identifiable if, if two models out of this model class, M and M prime here, have the same probability distribution, then that implies that these two models are the same up to some equivalence class. Now there's a little bit to unpack here. The first is we're, we're saying we assume that two models are the same, and, and this is always um, with respect to some model class. So it's, we, we talk more concretely about this in a second, but this will generally, sorry, we will, for the purpose of this talk, be something like two different kinds of causal models. So maybe uh, one model is um, ice cream causes, uh, ice cream consumption causes the weather to change, and the other model is um, uh, the weather change, uh, sorry, the sun hours cause ice cream consumption. Um, but if, if these two things can predict the same probability distribution, namely a strong correlation between uh, sun hours and ice cream consumption, um, this uh, does in, in reality not imply that the two models are the same. So this, this, um, this relation, like we don't have identifiability just from observational data. We, we can't say, um, yeah. We can have these different models with the same property distribution. So this property that out of equal property distribution, it follows that the models are the same doesn't hold. The second thing here is um, what I have in blue here, which is um, the probability distribution is with respect to some data. Um, this depends on what method we're talking about, uh, what model we're talking about. So one example for this would be um, the observational distribution of some data um, in terms of causal variables. Another example would be uh, when we get to this representation learning problem, the observational distribution only on the pixel level in terms of low level variables that are not causal. And then finally, the last qualifier in this property here is um, the equivalence relation. So we will never generally be able to um, fully identify models. There will always be some remaining ambiguity. Um, uh, and we have examples of this later, but often for instance, we have something like, if two models give you the same distribution of the data, then there will be the same up to permutations of the variables. If we don't train with labels, it will generally be, not be possible to, to distinguish um, the first variable of a, the first latent variable of a model is um, um, ice cream hours, uh, sorry, ice cream consumption. The second variable is sun hours from the case where the first variable is sun hours and the second is ice cream consumption. So there's some permutation symmetry there. Um, right. So to summarize this, identifiability is a pro pro uh, property of a model class, a data regime, and an equivalence relation that says that 
when two models from this model class give you the same data distribution, then the models are the same up to the equivalence relation. Now, why should you care about this? If we have identifiability in some setting, it means that we can identify ground truth causal properties just from the data by training a neural um, network version of this uh, uh, model class with maximum likelihood. There's some assumptions here. Um, the assumptions are that the model uh, family that we assume needs to be the correct one. So the ground truth model needs to be in this uh, family. Um, all of these statements are only true up to the equivalence relation. So uh, for instance, we will only resolve the true causal structure up to some permutation symmetry. Um, and generally all the statements I'm making here are only true in the limit of infinite training data and assuming that we have a perfect optimizer that, that somebody handed us uh, a way to really find the minimum of the lost landscape. But these are these last two things are assumptions that, that we always make in machine learning. And the first two points here are um, kind of uh, the defining or defining properties of, of identifiability. Okay. Now, let me sketch a little bit um, what kind of work has been done on representation learning and the question of when are representations and particular causal representations identifiable. identifiable. I've tried to draw a very biased map of the work in the space on two axes here. On the y-axis, here we have the data regime. That's the one property that identifiability depends on. Um, if we only have unsupervised data, so just images of a scene, This we live at this kind of top of this uh, y-axis. And if we have uh, full supervision, we live at the bottom of this y-axis. And in the middle, we'll have some kind of assumptions on the data comes in uh, particular structured ways, or there's some weak form of supervision. And I'll talk more about this in a second. On the x-axis, we have the model classes uh, that we're considering. So on the right, we have the most ambitious setting where we kind of assume that, that the model causal model and uh, the map to the data space can be anything. So there's unknown causal structure. We don't make any assumptions on linearity and such. Um, this is the, the most difficult setting to, to learn. Uh, on the left, we have the simplest setting where we assume that the causal graph is trivial. So this means that no causal factors um, are, uh, affect each other. Uh, the statistical, they, they will be statistically independent. And then traditionally, we also make some assumptions that, that uh, some uh, mechanisms in these models are linear, and then there's some of the distributions are non-Gaussians. These are really strong model assumptions. And then there are some, some settings in between. Now, the first work in this space is something that you may have heard about. This is uh, known as linear ICA. This is something that Arpo Hivarinen and some others developed around the year 2000. And, and this is really uh, based on very strong model assumptions. Uh, so if you assume that, that variables are just related um, with the data in some a uh, linear way, all the variables are independent, and then there's some source of non-Gaussianity, then we can actually identify the true causal variables uh, or the true uh, independent variables in the sense um, that, that generate some, some image data or other low-level data purely from observational unsupervised data. But sadly, pretty soon after that, people also figured out that uh, this, this really relies on these model assumptions. And for um, there's simple counter examples where we cannot identify the ground truth uh, variables um, just from observational data that, that came, I think they're even older than, than the linear ICA work. Anyway, this, this history continued like this a little bit. So people pushed um, towards less model assumptions and towards a stronger assumptions on the data regime. So there's a line of research on nonlinear independent components and this is on nonlinear ICA. And uh, then there's a hugely influential paper called IVAE. Uh, I will not go into the details of this, but then in uh, 2019, Francesco Locatello wrote a paper that won a best paper was at ICML that basically showed that without supervision, um, we can really not, um, uh, not identify a lot. This game continued a little bit. There's more work on identifiability from time series data. There's some work, what you can do if you have uh, very explicit labels on things and you can actually do a lot. Um, and then there are some works on, on weak supervision um, that, that showed that under weak supervision, we can identify uh, models and variables when, when we know something about the causal structure. Um, ultimately, it painted some kind of two-dimensional landscape. There's a number of settings, both well, with setting, I mean a combination of data regime, like assumption on the data that we have, and uh, model assumptions, under which we can um, uh, provably identify the, the high-level variables and the causal structure. 
This is uh, the promised land of identifiability in green here. And there are some uh, settings under which uh, we cannot identify things. And, and it's impossible without further assumptions or further data to really figure out what are the true variables that generate some low level data. But these two lands so far at least don't touch. There's some gray area in the middle. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the, the research in this space is now trying to figure out where exactly the boundary between these two uh, lands um, lives in this land. And of course, as a practitioner of this field, I hope that this green land will eat up this, this no man's land ultimately after a lot more research, but um, we don't know at this point. But what this work I'm presenting today is does is um, uh, make pretty weak model assumption, but make some assumptions on the data regime, namely that, that we have some form of weak supervision, and I'll get to that in a second, and push the land of identifiability a little bit further up um, such that we can claim that that we can identify we can we can learn causal structure in a setting that was previously not possible. Okay, now let's finally get to um, on the paper. I've I've talked long enough about um, the the general uh, research field. Um, and in our paper, we make I think two main contributions. There's a theoretical and an empirical one. And the theory is that we show that we can indeed identify uh, both the causal variables that that are behind. Uh, some, some low level data like pixels and the causal structure between these variables just from, from a form of weak supervision. So to do this, um, we introduce uh, what we call a latent causal model. A latent causal model uh, consists of a set of a number of uh, causal variables or high level variables in red here with a structural causal model between them. So uh, between these latent variables, we, um, we, we have a, a, a causal, Structures, a set of mechanisms that allow us to to reason about interventions and as such everything uh, I mentioned earlier, and then a the second component we have a decoder, a map from these high level variables to some data space of two images, for instance. This um, could just be some some rendering function. Later we'll implement this with a neural network. Uh, doesn't really matter for the theory too much. Now because we have this latent causal structure here, we can reason about. Uh, all things that causal models allow us to reason about. So in particular, we can ask what happens if we intervene, what happens if we change the mechanism of one of these causal variables. And um, then we can uh, pipe the uh, changed um, causal variables under, after the intervention through the same decoder, through the same rendering function, and we observe the effect of the interventions in the data space. So if we have this, this image of domino pieces before and after, you can see um, how um, flipping over one domino should translate into flipped over domino pixels in the data space. That's what you can do with the latent causal model. Now, the uh, form of weak supervision, the, the data regime that we assume in this work, for which we can make some, um, some statements, is that we assume that, that we actually have a data generating process that consists of such a model. So we have some unknown ground truth latent causal model. So there's nature itself, whatever generated our data, whatever system we're interested in is described by some, some causal model internally. And um, we can observe the system before and after something happens to this causal model, before and after an intervention occurs. Uh, so for instance, if, if we think about this domino example, we can see the, the state of the dominoes through a camera um, when everything is standing upright and then something happens and one domino is flipped over. And then we see a picture of the, the whole scene after the domino is flipped over. Um, and, and what happened in between corresponds to an intervention on this causal model. Just assuming the um, uh, data pairs on this pixel level, so we are not assuming any kind of labels. We're not assuming that somebody tells us, uh, hey, I flipped over this domino, I'm sorry, uh, or labels on, look at this new image, uh, all the dominoes are standing or three of them are fallen. We, we don't need anything of that. Now, assuming such data, um, we now consider the case that we uh, fit um, another LCM, one with neural components, and I'll talk about the implementation of this a little bit later, but we, we fit another LCM to this data, and we show theoretically that if this matches the data perfectly, if it maximizes the likelihood, um, so if the two models have the same uh, data, uh, the same um, uh, probability distribution of the data, that then the model we, we trained on the data will exactly have the same causal variables and the same causal structure as the data generating process, so as nature. So we can identify the causal variables and we can identify the causal structure just from this pixel level data. 
Now, um, I should qualify the statement a little bit. There's still some equivalence class we cannot resolve. So in particular, permutations are impossible. There's no way for us to know if, if we have these uh, five causal variables, uh, which of them we should label as causal variable one, which of them is causal variable two, and so on. But also, in some sense, it doesn't really matter. There's some, like, usually these, these kind of labels are irrelevant in practice. What we really just care about is the, the structure here. Um, and, and that's it. That's our identifiability theorem. Um, a lot of the work in this paper is in the proof, and I will not uh, go through that now. But if you find uh, these kind of things interesting, I'm happy to talk about um, uh, afterwards about it. But um, I just want to quickly flash that the way that we prove this actually uses ideas that look very similar to equivariance, to, to some ideas from geometric deep learning. In particular, we use um, we, we identify some uh, commutation uh, structures, some commuting diagrams where. Uh, about the behavior, how interventions and relabeling of, of things between two models um, uh, behave or should behave. And then we use some tools from category three, a language known as, um, as string diagrams to, to actually formulate this proof. Um, and yeah, maybe I, I keep this for, for questions. I should also be transparent here as much as I'd like this to be very general and applicable to any kind of system. We make uh, some assumptions to make this possible. And I'm afraid that some of these assumptions are actually necessary for this result. So the biggest assumption is really the data. We, we assume that we can observe the system in these kind of before and after pairs. We know that just from purely IID data, just from observing uh, simple images of a system, we cannot identify what are the meaningful variables, what are the uh, causal structures in the scene. But uh, we can break this this impossibility by um, uh, assuming non-IID data, and and we do this by assuming these kind of pairs of before after data. Um, this is a strong assumption. There has recently been some work on relaxing this. We also have some interest in that. Um, so let's hope that that some people can up with some come up with some possible more realistic data regimes. Then there are some more technical assumptions. Um, for instance, that our the causal variables are uh, just real numbers and have a smooth probability distribution, so we can't really deal with discrete objects right now. There's some ideas on how we can relax this, but some of them are difficult. And uh, maybe one thing that really makes makes it clear that this is not something we can just use on any kind of data. Um, right now, we need to assume that every like. In these kind of before after pairs, we always have like some hidden, we don't know what it is, but some intervention that happens. But right now we need to have that any possible intervention on any causal variable can occur in the data set. So if we have any kind of realistic uh, use cases where um, the humans interact, we also need uh, interventions that do potentially unsafe things. So if, if you think about autonomous driving, we might need a data example for when a car starts driving at a red traffic light, if we want to learn the causal graph of that system. And that's probably not such a great idea. So um, I think right now the applications of this are really limited to simulations. And we need to make some, some more progress until we can uh, use this in real world uh, data sets. So overall, I see the value of this more on the um, um, theoretic side. We show that in principle, we can really identify the structure from data, but the, the assumptions we need to make limit this to uh, non-practical settings right now, sadly. Now, that was... Um, a lot of theory. Now, what do you do with this in practice? Um, in addition to this, this main message that I want to get across that, that this causal representation learning is a possible task that we can actually identify important variables and causal structure from pixel level data without explicit labels. I want to give you a second message here. And that's that sometimes it's better to be implicit than to be explicit about modeling things like graphs. Um, so quick uh, reminder before we talked about two ways of how causal structure is represented um, in SCMs. So there's what I'd call an explicit representation where, um, and with that I mean this, this these, these causal mechanisms, these FI that determine the value of a causal variable as a function of noise variables and the parents of the causal variable, so the, the causes of this causal variable. But there's an additional uh, um, representation of causal structure, um, namely the solution function, the map that takes as input all the noise variables with the associated, which have an associated property distribution and maps them to the set of all the causal variables. And the nice thing here is about the solution function in, in this um, representation on the right side, you don't need to know which causal variable depends on which uh, uh, is the effect of which cause. So you don't need, you don't have a dependence of this function that explicitly represents the causal graph structure. Now, 
this may sound like a um, small difference, but in practice, it means that if we have to learn the solution function as opposed to these causal mechanisms, we don't have to learn a discrete graph object in our neural network explicitly. We can just learn a free from neural network and then later post hoc identify the graph. Now, the nice thing is that under the assumptions that, that we have in this work, uh, you know, these real causal variables and so on, um, these two different ways of representing causal structure contain exactly the same information. So you can always transform the explicit representation of causal structure into the implicit representation and vice versa. Um, this is pretty technical, uh, but if you want to implement these kind of things in practice, it, it can save you a lot of trouble um, because you don't have to learn which edges exist in a graph through gradient descent. Gradient descent doesn't really like discrete objects so much, or maybe we did a poor job with it. But anyway, I think it, it's definitely not harder. Now, how does this? Um, how how do we set up this whole thing? Um, basically, we built a variational autoencoder that consists of an encoder that takes pixel level data as input, outputs um, some latent variables, and these latent variables will be closely related to the causal variables. Uh, i get to that in a second. And then there's a decoder that takes these latent variables uh, as input and outputs pixel space again. And this whole thing is trained on uh, uh, via ELOS, so lower bound on the, um, the, the marginal likelihood. That's um, essentially a combination of a reconstruction loss and some um, regularization term. The direct way, the explicit way of building such a model is to identify the latent variable with the causal variables of a system and then build a prior that um, uh, describes the, the observational distribution of a causal variables. And this is something that um, requires you to really learn a graph explicitly as part of your, your learning problem. And this is possible, and we've gotten it to work, but it is very uh, finicky. So if you go to something like four causal variables, just four causal variables, uh, you'll find in practice that often you need to run something like five random seeds, and then just two or three of them will actually learn the right solution. Um, there are some problems with local minima in the lost landscape. So really not a lot of fun. I'm sure that others can do a slightly better job by just tuning uh, the strategy a bit, but um, I would not advocate for this too much. Instead, we, um, sorry. Oh yeah, this is on the learning problems we found. Um, uh, I don't want to get into the learning problems too much, but but there's a chicken and egg problem there because if you if you already know the graph um, and want to learn the the variables, then then it works pretty well. If you already know the variables and want to learn the graph, it works pretty well. But if you want to learn the chicken and the egg together, then it turns out that this is a really um, difficult learning problem in practice, and we, we we found we had to scan over random seeds quite a bit to get this to work. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to talk, talk about this. Uh, but the message that we learned here is don't learn graphs, don't learn explicit graph representations if you don't have to. Instead, what I would um, advocate for if you want to do something like this is to learn an implicit representation of causal structure using this idea that that the solution function, this this free form map from the noise to the causal variables, um, encodes the same information. So again, we we set this up like a VAE. There's an encoder from data space to to some latent space and decoder back to the uh, data space. But now we identify the latents with the noise variables of, of a structural causal model and train a neural network that uh, maps between the noise variables and, and the causal variables. So it parameterizes the causal structure somewhere in the weights of this neural networks, but we never have to learn explicit parameters that tell us whether a certain edge exists or not. It's just kind of hidden in, in, these, um, uh, uh, cause, uh, in this neural network weights somewhere. And we, can, we have an algorithm to extract this after training if we want to. Um, Again, skipping technical details here, this is a VAE parameterization that just wants to work when we run it on, on the data and we get uh, much nicer results. Um, now, what can you do with these models? Let's say we train this. We train this on this paired data of pre and post intervention um, uh, examples on the pixel level. We, we train this by maximizing the right uh, elbows, the right um, uh, VAE loss. And what can we do with the model after it has converged um, and we are done with training? The most obvious thing and the thing that we set out to do is given some image, we can map the pixels to values of the causal variables. So given an uh, image of our robot arm interacting with lights, we can we can get out uh, uh, values for where's the robot arm, what sales are the lights in, and so on. Uh, second, we can extract the causal graph learned by this model. It's a little bit more work than this explicit uh, setup that we that I first talked about, but we have two different algorithms um, that, that work for this. and. Uh, I'll also show in a second that it works reliably. 
Um, so this answers the question that, for instance, the, whether the robotic arm causes the, the lights to go on and touches it, or, or whether the lights actually cause the robotic arm to move to them by virtue of somebody sitting under the table with a magnet. Um, we can also, given two images, we can ask what happened here. We can we can infer the intervention that happened between two things and um, which which variable was intervened upon. Did somebody just press a light switch or did somebody move the robotic uh, arm uh, to, to then do something? And uh, finally, this is a VAE, a VAE is a generative model, so we can generate um, observational, interventional, and also counterfactual data. So answer what if questions. Uh, given an, an image, we can ask, how would the scene look like if, if we would move the robot arm? How would the scene look like if we'd um, intervene on the robot arm and, and kind of include the, the causal downstream effects? We'll get to an example of this in a second. Now, let's, um, uh, let's follow up these words with some deeds. Uh, we've run a couple of experiments on this, and I will not show you all of them, um, but here they're loosely organized by data dimension on the x-axis and by the causal uh, system complexity on the y-axis. We start with some toy examples. We use the standard benchmark of the field, um, which involves flying rabbits under different lighting conditions. But we were not totally satisfied with these bunnies, so we decided to make our own benchmark, and there we get to this robot finger, and uh, that's what I talked about in a second. And then finally, and this is probably the last slide I'll show you today, is uh, that we try to see how much we could uh, scale this up to higher dimensional systems. Let me start with this uh, data set we introduced called, called Causal Circuit. Causal Circuit is um, looks very much like the scene I started this talk with. So you have images, it's not actually a video, but we just show individual images of this robotic finger interacting with a number of uh, lights that are touch sensitive. Um, and just to make this a little bit more interesting, we also came up with some a little bit yeah, made up causal structure here. So clearly the, the robotic arm causes the, the lights to go on when they are touched, but there's also this, this weird wiring between the, the lights. When we touch the green, uh, green light to, to go on, it also causes the red light to go on. This is a little bit silly, but I just wanted to make it non-trivial. I could come up with whatever you wanted. We simulate this in some way. We also uh, we publish this data set soon for, for other practitioners in the field. But um, for this talk, the most important thing is that we trained our model and some baselines on this paired uh, pre- and post-intervention data that we use, this weekly supervised setting. And what did we find? The first thing is that um, if we build this, this um, latent, uh, this, this ILCM, this uh, implicit latent causal model, and uh, study the causal variables that we find, um, they nicely correspond to the ground truth concepts here, which is the, the main goal we had in this project, right? So what you see here is we start from, from the scene shown on the left. We encode this with the encoder of our model. And then we kind of just vary one causal variables at a time um, and decode it back to the data space and see what happens. And you see when we uh, vary the first causal variable learned by our model, only the robotic arm moves around and no other uh, property of the scene changes. The second causal variable learned by the model only um, corresponds to the state of the red light. The third one only corresponds to the state of the green light. And the fourth one only corresponds to the state of the blue light, which shows that um, our model learned to disentangle. We really identified the ground truth uh, high-level concepts here, just like in the generative uh, process uh, of the data, as opposed to unsupervised baselines trained on this data where just varying one of the latent variables of a model will mess with uh, everything at once. Um, we can also extract the causal graph, like I said before. And uh, this is, as a reminder, this is the true causal graph of the generative process here. So the robot uh, arm causes lights to go on when it touches them. And then there's some um, circuitry that we invented. And at first, this may look a little bit different. This is the graph that our model learned. Um, but if you actually look at what, what the different variables correspond to, and uh, rearrange uh, these, these a little bit, you see that this is actually the same structure. There's a graph isomorphism between these two structures. So in, in our model correctly learned that the robotic arm causes the lights and not vice versa. And it also correctly learned that the green light and the blue light control the red light in, in the way that we uh, set this up. So it, it did learn the correct graph. And then finally, I think this is maybe the, the most interesting thing because we learned this causal representation, not just statistical representation of the data. We can um, we can reason about the scene in a causal way. We can take our model um, and just ask it what would happen if we were to move the the robot arm, if we intervene on the robot arm and move it somewhere. And this is a 
this is kind of imagined just from the model, doesn't use any ground truth data here. And you see that the, the, the model kind of correctly learned that if we move the um, uh, robotic finger such that it touches one of the buttons then the corresponding light will go on, even though it describes these as uh, independent variables in its, uh, in its uh, internals. Yeah, we can also quantify all of these things and there's some, some metrics, but honestly, that's, that's a little bit boring. We, we have the table that, that shows our model in bold and other methods in not bold. So uh, that's, that's all we needed for, to, to make the neurons reviewers happy. Now, the last experiment I wanted to, to show you today is uh, we, we are a little bit worried about scalability of this approach. Um, uh, so we designed a toy experiment. We just, we can easily vary the number of causal variables. Um, and we did this in a very simple way. So some things are linear here. Um, and we found that this approach without any further tuning works robustly up to something like 10 variables. So here on the plot on the y-axis, you have a, a disentanglement score where one basically means we, we learned the correct variables, the ground truth. Uh, factors and zero means we um, learn totally random information. The the green bluish lines are base signs and red is our method. So this works perfectly until eight causal variables with 10 causal variables is still pretty good. But then when we get to something like 20 causal variables, it does break down a little bit and the variables become more uh, mingled together. Um, now, of course, real world systems often have hundreds or thousands of causal variables. So we are pretty far away from just being able to throw this on any kind of problem. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's this kind of sobering message here, but um, it brings me to a little bit of an outlook. Um, I think we made some progress in understanding on under which circumstances we can learn causal structure, but at the same time, I I would say that this research is not directly useful at this point. Um, here, I want to summarize some properties of causal representation as it is practiced right now, causal representation learning, and what we need for this field to become practically useful. And one important thing, I already mentioned this before, is that right now we are a little bit stuck on uh, identifiability theorems, on proving under which circumstances we can actually identify causal variables, causal structure. But what we should actually be doing is um, find real world problems and show that learning causal representation is actually useful for these problems. And this is something where very little results have been published so far, as far as I'm aware. Um, about our concrete work, we, we have this data setting that uses this pairing of pre and post uh, data. Um, and I think that's a useful abstraction of some systems, but it's, it's not very realistic right now. And we should move towards more realistic data regimes like uh, video data, for instance, if we just have like a sequence of frames that's a much more interesting uh, setting that is related to what we've been doing, but it's it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, relation. Um, right now, interventions are kind of handed to us on a silver platter for some external uh, uh, all-knowing intervener. We just assume that somebody performs this intervention. But uh, if we talk about interactive settings, it would be very interesting to see if we can also learn uh, how we can actually implement these interventions. Can we learn policies to perform interventions in these settings? Um, and then more technical limitations right now, our causal variables are pretty much fixed. Uh, there's no way for any of the big causal representation link papers out there to, to deal with variable scene compositions, for instance. And of course, if you want to go to something like robotics or autonomous driving, you need that. And maybe more uh, fundamental, right now we assume that there's a acyclic graph structure that describes causal mechanisms um, at the heart of, of the models. But reality doesn't always uh, stick to DAX. And often um, we have uh, weaker relational structures. If you have two domino pieces, one can knock over the other, but also vice versa. How do we model that? Um, yeah, more broadly, we should go from toy experiments to more realistic experiments. Um, and I think this, this concludes my criticism of, of all I've presented to you today. Uh, so, uh, there's a long way to go for this field to be useful, but I think we're making some progress in understanding what's uh, fundamentally possible. That's all I wanted to say. And in this work, we studied the question, is it possible to learn causal variables, the high level meaningful representations and the causal structure from low level data like pixels without explicit labels? Uh, we showed you some theory that this is indeed possible uh, in some weekly supervised setting. And uh, also I talked about a practical implementation based on variational autoencoders and demonstrated this in some experiments. Um, this is work together with my collaborators, uh, Pim Dahan, uh, Philip Lippe and Taku Cohen from Qualcomm IA Research and the University of Amsterdam. Um, we presented this at NURIPS 
two weeks ago in, in New Orleans. It was uh, a lot of fun and uh, some nice interest from, from people in the crowd. But um, I think there's also a number of other uh, very relevant papers if you like this, this line of research. There's a very nice review article by Bernhard Schilkopf and others uh, towards causal representation learning that came out uh, one and a half years ago. Um, and then there are some papers that kind of led up to our work um, by uh, the Schilkopf lab, all of them, and one by, by uh, folks in, in Amsterdam at, at the university here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Johan. That's a very, very interesting um, talk. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions and there's some questions in the chat. Um, yeah, Yincheng, you wanna go ahead? I think the first question is related to slide number 18. Oh, she doesn't have a mic at the moment. Um, I'll read aloud. So she's asking your weak supervision assumption um, do you need to assume you know which variables are intervened or do you just assume that some interventions take place? Ah, oh, yeah, great question. No, we do not need that knowledge. We just need to assume that some intervention, well, actually, sometimes it can also be no intervention. But uh, in some samples, some intervention needs to have taken place and we don't need to know uh, which one it was. We can, we can learn to infer that. All right, thank you. Uh, she has two more questions. The other one is, do you have any idea about sample complexity of observed intervention needed okay. when you have increased number of nodes in your graph? I think this is, that was slide 35, maybe. Yes, I, I will probably not get to that uh, slide quickly enough, but I can answer it anyway. Um, no, I do not know. Um, I think it's it's a very non-trivial question, how many, um, uh, like to, to study this the sample complexity theoretically. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, I wish I had a good answer to that, though. It would tell you how hopeless this this whole line of research for real world application is actually. Um, and the last question from her is: I asked this question because I like to understand whether your degraded result in your scalability scalability experiment is due to increase in need of data or increase error in your particular arch. For example, in uh, the part, I guess you're not doing exact MLE. Yes. So ultimately, I do believe that if we should just throw infinite data on it and also tune the hyperparameters a little bit, we should be able to, to get this up always. But the question is, how much does the data requirement uh, scale with the dimensionality? And it will probably be in some, which is exactly your last question, right? It will probably be in some very nonlinear way. I, like, like one hint is that the number of potential graphs between n variables, uh, what does it grow as? No, left as an exercise to the listener. I, I should be able to, I should know this, but uh, definitely very nonlinear. Um, number of decks of a system of size n. Yeah, I don't know. Something to look up on Wikipedia, but it's it's probably exponential or something like this. Um, so I in principle, if you had infinite data and time to tune hyperparameters on a validation set, I think you could beat everything. But in practice, with a finite data budget, um, we 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 reach limitations. Uh, thank you, Johan. Uh, before I go to Jean's uh, question, um, regarding this slide, um, this, this entanglement score, for example, if you use more causal variables, where do you reckon it's going to your method will plateau? I can see the other ones are plateauing around 0 0.2, 0 point, 0 point ah. 0. <laughs> yep. uh, Actually, I think if you kind of just very randomly uh, pick variables, then you'll probably get to something like 0 0.2 or oh, is that true? No, it can't be, it still has to go down with. Actually, I don't think it will, like, I don't think this is a real plateau. I think um, uh, this will still continue to go down, but kind of just slowly. And I don't have a good reason for why this is, but if you have a uh, hundred variables, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the segment score should be bounded from below by zero. And, yeah. and um, um, that these methods will not be much better than that. All right. Um, I could think more about this. I think there's some, you could probably come up with some theoretic lower bound for this, mm. for like like totally random configuration of variables. And that depends a little bit on N. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep, thank you. Uh, we have two. Yeah, uh, Eugene, do you have a question? You wanna go ahead? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. So, uh, sorry, I'm not really too familiar with this line of work, but I find it quite interesting. Can you please 
spend a bit more time on the architectural implementation details of like what is this so what's the difference say with a standard beta v of your of the way that you train or the architecture and what are these latent noise variables i didn't really catch that like in practice what what are they yes uh, great uh, i'm happy to um, so the encoder and the decoder are very similar to a standard beta VE, right? So if we use image data, this would just be a convolutional network that takes inputs uh, as inputs images and outputs uh, a probability distribution over some latent variables. So usually we just assume that we, we parameterize this probability distribution of the mean and the variance. And then uh, during the training, this variance will become smaller and smaller. So essentially, this is just the, just the mean matters um, so much. And the decoder is kind of the inverse of that. It takes its input, some latent variables and outputs um, an image, and then uh, you, you train this on reconstruction error and some KL divergence uh, between um, the uh, distribution of the latent variables and uh, some prior. Now, the prior is where the magic happens. Um, the prior distribution describes, as in a better VE, a distribution of the latent variables. But in a better VE, we usually just assume that the, the latent variables are all independent of each other. Here, we assume that the latent variables in, in this implicit version um, um, are independent of each other for the before data. But then when we train this with the pairing with the uh, post-intervention data, um, we, we always do this together because otherwise we can't learn anything. There, there will be um, uh, subtle dependencies between the before and after data. And this is expressed in the prior. And we model this um, by learning this solution function and then when you actually write down the probability distribution of the uh, before noise variables and after noise variables, the noise in, in an SCM, including the solution function, you, you get some particular probability distribution there. And this is what we use as a prior. And, and including the causal structure in this way into your VAE is all you need to, to identify the causal structure. This was still a pretty hand wavy answer. I, I think I have a backup slide that, that gives you more uh, concrete details on this, but this will, yes. So here is, is a, a sketch of this uh, VAE setting uh, for uh, before and after data, right? So we, we we take the before image and the after image and pipe it through an encoder. And then we get our latent variables, which are these noise variables. And now we need, um, and we do this, then we, we pipe this through a decoder to get our reconstructed image. And that's all we need for the reconstruction um, error in the lost term. How do we get the prior um, over these latent variables? Now, this is where the learn solution function comes into play. Um, we uh, uh, push the noise variables of the before image and the noise variables of the latent variables of the after image, both through this learn solution functions to get the uh, causal variables before and after. Um, and then the in these causal variables that we then have, um, you, you should be able to see the um, the effect of the intervention. So basically, uh, there's one variable in there, which is the one that we targeted with the intervention, which has a this particular distribution of this causal variable that is independent of everything else. And then the downstream effects of the causal variable have a distribution that depends on the parents. And this is uh, something that if you write this down very carefully, you can you can just model as a function of um, some base distributions and this learned and real solution function. I realized that it was a very technical answer to this question. Um, um, I don't yeah, think no, I, I think can give that, a much better explanation now. But thank you. That's that's what I that's what I was kind of looking at. So essentially, you so you still have this noise prior, which is the same as a standard beta VAE here with the loss, and yep. then you also essentially pass the noise variables, which is essentially your latent space, to a neural network. Yes. You get this new set of variables with the same yes. dimensionality out, and you have an extra loss at the end on these ones to yes. regularize everything. Yes, um, that's, can you that's talk a good summary. More about this extra loss again at, at the very end. Um, um, what, what is what is in practice? How do you get this loss to enforce the fact that um, it gets the causal variables to uh, to be nice and separated and the noise and the noise variables as well? Because at the end, what you mm -hmm. are varying at the end is the is the noise variables. When you when you do the the experiments where you change one of them, is it the causal variables you change or the noise ones? And then you pass them through the decoder. Um, you, you can say it uh, in terms of either like uh, the description of the scene in terms of noise variables and in terms of causal variables is equivalent and and uh, the map between them is just through this this neural network the solution function um so in terms of the noise variables you can show that just one variable changes between before and after and that's probably the, the easiest way to see the nice structure here and this is the variable that that the intervention happened on um 
in terms of the causal variables, uh, all like the variable that the intervention happened on and then the downstream variables of it uh, change. Um, but I think in the noise variable, like to, to write down the, the joint property distribution of all of these variables, which we need for the prior, um, we we need the the um, noise distributions of the before state and the um, for the variable that was targeted with the intervention, we need the distribution for the causal variable. That is the, the very technical answer. And, and we can just plug them together and get the full prior. Um, for more details, I can, this is not a very satisfactory answer, but I think it's easy to see this in equations and I'm afraid I don't have that on slides. It's, it's in the paper though. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, that I'm, kind of I'm makes happy sense? With, with that. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Cool. Thank you, Johan. Um, if you have time, can we take one quick question? One more, one more. So, okay. Yeah. Yep. I'm uh, not in a rush. You want to, you want to go ahead? Avinash? Yep. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to continue on the previous question, like if you have a like normal VAE loss, like how do you prevent collapse of the latent variables? Ah. Um, so essentially, um, in some sense, we what's what's a good answer to this? Um, I, I I think this this comes from the KL divergence between the prior and uh, the uh, posterior distributions. Yeah, but that's, the KL, di KL divergence itself will enforce this sort of collapse, right? Like, how do you ensure that the latent variables which you have, like pre and post interventional, like these latent variables, how do you ensure that they correspond to the object which of interest, basically? Like, so how do you, how do you ensure that Z one corresponds to robot arm and Z two corresponds to red light or something like that? Yes, um, it's not very clear from the sketch, maybe, but um, it, it comes from the fact that we have this particular prior that that um, basically says only one variable between the before and after thing, or maybe sometimes zero variables, is intervened upon, and everything else follows from that change. And um, you you can. Like with, with with latent collapse, you can never satisfy this the structural constraint, right? If if your mm -hmm. uh, posterior is equal to your prior, um, it will not. If you sample from the posterior, um, it, it will not follow the the structure where all the noise variables except for one stay the same between the before and the after image. Um, this 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 structure in the latent space really forces the um, posterior to not collapse, but instead um, align with the causal structure of the system. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is also a very intuitive answer at this point. I I have to think if I have a better argument. But this is really like latent collapse is something we never saw in any experiment. So I'm pretty sure that the theory here kind of kind of mm. holds. Um, okay. Okay. And I have another question here. Like, um, can you like can you just use nonlinear additive assumption to replace this contrastive kind of approach? Like, is that nonlinear mm. additive noise assumption? Sufficient uh, enough to capture this behavior. The problem is that nonlinearity it could help, but then you need to assume that all your relations between variables are linear. Oh, sorry, that that all the variables are Gaussian. Like usually, you cannot distinguish nonlinearities from non-Gaussianities, right? It's it's um, yeah. they have the same effect in distributions, um, and when you want to allow for both, uh, you're usually in trouble. So historically, people have given identifiability proofs either for the setting where things are non-linear and Gaussian or non-Gaussian and linear, uh, but allowing yeah. for both is hard. And, and the addi additional complexity comes from the fact that the, the map to the data space will kind of always be non-linear. Um, and we like, also want the cause. No, no, my question Sorry. was like in latent space, Yeah, if you just make an assumption that the latent variables are somehow like mm -hmm. interrelated by non-linear, like yes. no, gravity noise model or something, Mm -hmm. Can you, but just by that assumption, can you replace this contrast to learning approach? Like, can you just use one data set mm -hmm. to model with that assumption to model this sort of behavior? Does mm -hmm. it capture I, it? I don't think so because, uh, and I, I think the, the fact that the decoder is nonlinear plays into this because usually the, what you can resolve in the latent space depends on what structure you have in the, the, the decoder. Uh, okay. There are some results on what you can do um, with um, kind of latent li linear mechanisms between the latent variables if 
something is if the, the noise is non-Gaussian, but they mm -hmm. only hold if the decoder is also linear. And I think vice versa, it's also true that if you if say some some source of uh, non-linearity in the latent space, you can get some additional structure, some identifiability, but that only holds if we still require the decoder to be linear, because otherwise it's impossible to tell apart which effects came from the decoder and which effects came yeah. from the um, uh, actual non-linear causal structure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I think that would be a great um, direction of progress otherwise. Yeah, okay. And like, uh, yeah, another last question. Can we can we say that in, in your framework, right? Like, can we say that the entire interventional distribution is part of your observational data set? Inst interventional data mm -hmm. is part of your observational data. Yeah, I, so definitely the, I, I would even say what we have is stronger than interventional data because we have this paired data. It's more like counterfactual yeah. data. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely, yeah, I'm not sure if I would still call it observational data, but the data set that we train on is, uh, is includes the interventional uh, okay. data. I, I, I'd probably prefer to call it counterfeit. Otherwise, people think we have kind of separate data sets for different interventions, and we have one data set where we have these pairs, which is mm. uh, strictly stronger. There's some recent works, though, where mm. they uh, do uh, causal representation learning with identifiability from interventional data sets. But they need very strong model assumptions. So that, that, that only works, for instance, in, in the linear setting, where okay. including the decoder being linear. De oh, okay. So that's that's not very practically useful at this point. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. But yeah, are you are you working in this space? You had some uh very yeah, I'm currently insightful questions. Yeah. yeah, I'm currently exploring this space. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious I, to see what you uh yeah, yeah. work on. Yeah, I'll, I'll text, I'll email you regarding a few more questions. Maybe we can discuss later on. Yeah, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash. Um, yeah, thank you, Johan. I think um, I think we can leave the seminar up to here, if that's okay. Um, I just want to thank you, Johan, for sharing your time. Also, this will be the last seminar of the year. So I wish everyone um, happy holidays and everyone get a good, good rest for starting the new year. So thank you, Johan, again, if we can give everyone an applause. And um, yep, thank you for sharing your time and your work with us. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure and uh, happy holidays, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, see you, everyone.